Okay, we're going to continue now with uh, chapter two. If there is no more questions about chapter chapter one, okay. So here, can you uh, can, you, can you want to share the screen? Now, can you see my PowerPoint? Can you see my PowerPoint, people? Somebody can yeah, come. No, okay, yes. okay. I'm I'm going to try to write on here uh, instead of on Word. Let's see how it goes. Okay, because I had some problems with Word. So let's see if we can improve it with uh, PowerPoint. Uh, if I can try to set it up here. Okay, so this is the uh, the, the agenda for the full for the full chapter, okay? So uh, it doesn't say here, but I'm going to start with the, an introduction. I'm not going to review that much because uh, that's something that you should review on your own. It's about being bending, okay? And then we're going to go with interpolation. Remember, the interpolation that we employed for bar elements was linear. In this case, uh, we're going to use uh, cubic interpolation. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. And then we're going to deduce the stiffness matrix similarly as we did before. What we do is we take the equilibrium of these two joints, two points. Uh, but that's, that's going to be for a simple element. But again, we could have uh, beam elements in a plane with different uh, local reference systems. So what we have to do is we can express the stiffness matrix in a common global reference system, okay? Similarly, what we did in, the, in chapter one. And then we can use that in order to analyze an example. And you will see that in this case, what we do is we can combine uh, the two effects, bending and also in plane force. So, we can apply a, a, a force which can produce compression on an element and also can produce some bending. So the two uh, effects will be combined. And at the end, I'm going to, again, some, make some comments of how can we implement uh, all of this in order to use in the computer program, in order to analyze uh, this, this type of frames in, in the plane. More or less, that's the idea for the, the agenda for the whole uh, chapter. So before we go to the interpolation, let's go to uh, like an introduction. Okay, we can say this is uh, it's an introduction. Okay, so uh, before we go on with the deduction of the, the stiffness matrix and all of that, so we need to say a couple of words about bending. Okay, so uh, what's a beam? A beam is something like this. So if this is L. So we can say that L is much larger than B or D. Okay, so there is one dimension which is more important than the others. And also in this case, the load, you see if this is the local reference system, okay? You see that the external load is not aligned with the axis of, the, of this element. So we say that this is lateral, load. So lateral load, that means that the result is going to be bending. So we're going to have something like this, and then we're going to have something like, like this. And here, we're going to have, the, as a result, some curvature. OK? Uh, what else? Assumptions, very similar to what we did in, in the previous chapter. We consider that the material is linear elastic. Okay. 
okay, linear elastic material. In this case, uh, when we want to say something about the, the material, we say simply <clears throat> John modulus and Poisson ratio. And also, we can consider that the flexions are small. Okay, so for example, that means that if we have this problem, okay, and we apply a large force here, so this is going to deflect like this. So this is going to be the deflection depending on X, this is external force, this is the X direction. But since we assume that the deflections are small, we assume that when we consider that this axial displacement is neglectable. Okay, when you do a nonlinear analysis, in that case it's different. You consider that this will produce some axial motion, not in our case. We're going to consider that we can apply this force and this motion, this axial motion is neglectable, okay? So that means that when you analyze, for example, a case when you have aligned forces and lateral forces, what we can do, we can solve the problem, the two problems independent of each other, okay? That's some of the implications of what we are doing. So uh, now let's remember a couple of things about uh, beam bending, okay? So say, let's remember some basics from beam bending. Okay, so we have our beam. We know that it's very long. This is X, this is Y, okay? We have the load. This is the load. Remember, this is force per unit length. This is a review. I'm not going to make all the deductions in detail. So that will be part of you. Okay. So what we do, remember, is that we consider the equilibrium of a, an arbitrary element of length dx. Okay, well, so we take this element, we analyze it here. So the equilibrium of an arbitrary element. So we have this here. So this is a negative phase. This is a positive phase. We're going to keep using the same convention that we employed uh, from Popov's. So on the left-hand side, on the left, on the negative face, this is going to be the shear force. This is going to be the bending moment. Remember, these are internal forces. Okay, so this position is X. On the right-hand side, we have the same values with a small change. Similarly for this case. So it's going to be MZ plus on a small change. Now we have here also the external force which uh, is acting in this little element. Okay? I'm not going to do the details, you have to review it. So the static equilibrium. We have that dv at dx is equal to minus p of x and dmz 
dx is equal to minus v. And if we combine these two, we have our very old friend, the second derivative of the bending moment is equal to v e of x. So that's an equilibrium equation for a, an arbitrary element. That means that if we solve it, if we solve it, uh, since this is an arbitrary element, we can be sure that if an arbitrary element is in equilibrium, any the whole system, the whole beam is in equilibrium. That's, that's the idea, okay? Also, something which is very important from this figure is that this is the sign convention that we will be using. So this is the sign convention. This is pop-ups. So that's the same sign convention that we have used before. Okay, now, if this equation, we try to solve it, that will be useful only for statically the e determinate cases, okay? Because those cases, those systems, by definition, uh, could be, uh, its reactions could be calculated using the uh, equilibrium equations. Now, uh, the question that, we, that comes to our mind is what happens if we have an indeterminate cases. In that case, this is not enough, so we need to include some more equations, okay? And those equations, remember, are, or, or are derived from the kinematic hypothesis. Well, so we write here, uh, this, previous equation is useful for determinate cases, but for indeterminate cases, We need a material relation. Okay, so let's remember we assume that the kinematic hypothesis is correct. Okay. So what we do is we say that uh, if we have a beam like this, and we have two sections here and here, separated a distance dx, okay? These deforms like this, what happens is that this section comes into here, and this other one comes into here. But these are straight. So we say uh, plain sections remain straight. And of course, if you have two sections that rotate because they have to keep straight, okay? The amount that they get closer varies linearly with the vertical distance, okay? That's uh, what we write in this way. So we say that epsilon x is uh, proportional to the distance to y, okay? So that's proportional. Okay, now, uh, this is one assumption. The other assumption is that, uh, as we said before, 
is that the material is linearly elastic. So we said material is linearly elastic. Okay, so we say, we say that sigma x is equal to E epsilon x. So this is for the, for the case when we have a, a unidirectional stress component. That's the case, okay? In beam bending, we deal with only one stress, sigma x. So this is for uniaxial case. So uh, if we consider both, we can say that this stress is proportional to y. And we know that, uh, we know that at the neutral axis, stress is uh, zero on the deck and at the bottom, uh, normal stresses are extreme, either large or, or, or positive or negative, but extremes. That, that's a, a, a consequence of this, this assumption. Okay, so uh, here, if I can find where am I? So we can say, Sigma x, since this here is proportional to y, sigma x is also a constant times y. Because e in the elastic region, e is a constant. Since this term is proportional to y, we can say that sigma x, the stress, is going to be a constant of proportionality times y. So if we combine these two, we get this one here. What else? Similarly, for the for the uh, another assumption is that uh, since the the deflection is small, we can say that uh, since deflection. Is small. The curvature may be approximated by the second curve, second derivative. Okay, so we can say that. Let's suppose that C is the curvature. Okay, so C is one over k, and this k is the radius of curvature. This c is the curvature. So we can say that this is approximately equal to, well, I'm sorry, let, let me put the, the, the correct expression and then I'm going to simplify. Christ. So it's equal to the second derivative and we divide it by the square root of one plus the first derivative is square like this. I'm sorry, this is, this, is not, this, this is not correct. This is raised to the one and a half power, sorry. So this is raised to the three halves. Now, now comes the simplification. If the, the deflection is small, this is small. And when you raise it to the second power, this is neglectable. 
So we can say that the curvature is approximately equal to the second derivative. Okay. So with this, this is an approximation. We can say that uh, epsilon x is equal to minus y v comma xx sigma x is equal to minus y e v comma xx and uh, integrating over the section. We can find that mz of a section is equal to ei sub c v, v comma xx, where i sub c, remember, how do you evaluate i sub c, anybody? Anybody, how do you calculate i sub c? How do you calculate i sub c, please, people? Anybody, how do you calculate this? I need to be certain that you're following me. Mr. Valle, how do you calculate I sub C? I sub C, how do you calculate? Mr. Valle. <laughs> how do you calculate it? How do you? What's the MC. formula? Uh, uh, one over. No, 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 no. I'm asking, I'm asking the formula. I'm not asking the value for any specific section. In general, how do you calculate I sub C? M squared. No, I insist. The second I, oh. W integration. Exactly. That's, that's what we're saying. Because that's. What you're trying to remember is just one specific case. I need here the general situation, okay? And the general, uh, if I can find what is my here, is the integral, double integral of y squared dA. Yes, for rectangle is VHQ divided by 12. For the circular section, Depends on the diameter to the fourth, et cetera. Okay, but that's the formula. And Y is measured from where? Y is measured from? The tail axis. Yes. So you identify the centroid of the section and you say that the, the stresses at that point is zero, and then you remember this expression, and then you can say that the, the, the stresses changes linearly from the neutral axis. Yes. Okay. So this, this is just remembering you are responsible for reviewing this. Next week, I'm going to include a question in the evaluation about this. Okay? You have to review it because we're going to go on with the, the material. And I need you to, re, to be certain that you have reviewed this. So this is being recorded. I'm going to include a question on this topic, all of these deductions these cases in the evaluation next week, next uh, Wednesday. So you have to review it. You have to review it. Okay. Now let's, let's go now to our business. Our business is finite elements. Um, before we leave, let me go back here. Okay, I need this relation. See, this relation. The shear force, remember, is equal to the negative of this first derivative of the bending moment. Okay, 
So here we have deduced an expression for the bending moment. So we can combine, and before we go on, because this is something that we're going to need uh, quite, quite often during these uh, deductions, let's put it in here. And we can say here like, and the shear force is equal to minus EI sub C, V comma one, two, three. Okay, now uh, we have forgotten to say a couple of words that uh, in this case, as constant section beams we are dealing with. Uh, section is constant, okay? So I sub C, you see that doesn't depend on X. E doesn't depend on X, okay? So there, so we're gonna need these two. You have to be careful with this negative. It's something I didn't invent. It's something that is there. We have to be careful and that's it. Okay, I, I'm not going to ask you about questions about this because this is something that you studied in uh, solid mechanics. And we review it at the beginning of uh, ship structures and we employ it a lot in ship structures. So it's your responsibility. Now let's go on. Now, let me insert here. So we're going to start now. This is 2.1. There. So, um, let's compare these two cases, okay? Let's consider this case. And these are pins. Okay, let's put a force, any force that we want here. It's an external force. Now, let's build something similar, not the same, similar in this way. So we have a long element like this, like this, and like that. And now let's apply the same external force here. What are the differences between this case and this case? What's the differences? Somebody, anybody? Number of joints. That's, uh, no, we could also have three joints here. There is no connection between the elements. The support. Exactly, exactly. Now let's, let, oh, Jesus keeps erasing it. I don't know why, it's something strange. Now, the problem here is that we could have that this element, okay, could be something like this. And this element could be something like this. You see that the rotation of this element and the rotation of this element is different. Why? Because in general, for example, let's apply a force here and a force here. What happens here? There is continuity in rotation. Okay, so in, in general, rotation or slope is going to be important in this chapter, okay? Uh, this is a fourth order problem. And uh, the problem is that uh, 
when we have fourth order problems, rotation or slopes are possible geometric boundary conditions. So if we need to specify geometric boundary conditions, which include rotations, as we are seeing here, we need to have, or we need to, to be able to implement geometric boundary conditions directly in the process. So as a result of what I'm saying, we need to have for every joint, in every joint, as, as a degree of freedom, we need to have the, the, the displacement. But not only that, we need to include as, as a degree of freedom, the rotation of these joints. Okay, so let's try to summarize. Since this is a fourth order uh, problem. Okay, geometric boundary conditions may be values of displacement or, as we say here, rotations. Okay? So if we have a, a bar problem, we could work like this because we have continuity in displacement. If we had a beam problem, we need to, in this case, for example, we need to implement continuity of rotation also. Since this is a fourth order a problem, we need to be able to implement boundary conditions which include values of rotations. So as a result of that, this is what I wanted to, to, to employ, is that we need to include, uh, as degrees of freedom, in this case, we need to include not only displacement, but also rotation. So for these problems, okay, we need, see, we need, to consider as degrees of freedom, okay, of every joint, the displacement and the rotations. Or if you want, the slopes. Okay, so in this case, if when we implement continuity, remember, we can say that the displacement of this element and the rotation of this, I'm sorry, this point have to be equal to the displacement and rotation of the next one. Okay? And that's consistent because in this case, this is fourth order uh, problem, and we could have rotations as uh, boundary conditions. Okay? Now, the, and the result of that is the following, is that when we do interpolation, this is what we are going to do, we need to consider for every joint, we have to consider the displacement and the rotation for to develop, to complete the interpolation. Okay, so, uh, so, if we employ line elements for a discretization, of a structure, we will have two degrees of freedom. That's the displacement in the vertical direction and the rotation of every joint. So if we have something like this, you see that it's very long. So we're going to find this element with this joint 
and this joint, okay? This is going to be our local reference system, the same as before, but now the problem is that we need to consider as degrees of freedom, not only the displacement. So we're going to consider that this joint can move in this direction. That's going to be D1Y, local. Same thing for this one. It can move in the vertical direction, and that's our second uh, joint of this element. But also now, we have to consider, come on. We also have to consider the rotation. So the rotation is going to be, for example, phi one, this is the first joint in the Z direction, this is local. Same for the other, phi two Z local. So what we're going to do is we're going to set from these values, these two values here, and these two values here, we're going to set a, an interpolation. Question for you. If I, if I have to interpolate uh, in this point for the displacement and rotation, in this point for the displacement and the rotation, what order is going to be the polynomial for the interpolation? So our interpolation polynomial will be of order what? What will be the order of interpolation? Second order. No, no, no second order. How many, how many constants do you have in a polynomial of second order? How many constants do you have? No, come on, come on. How many, you have yeah. three. You have a zero plus a one X plus a two X squared, two, three. Yeah. And here, the third order, yes. But in, because in this case, you have four uh, conditions. So you have to take this polynomial and make it be equal to D1X on the left. Has to be equal to D1, D2Y on the right. That's two conditions. Then you have to differentiate it and make it equal on the left to Phi1Z. And that the derivative e evaluated on the right on L has to be equal to Phi2Z. So you have to satisfy four conditions. Okay, so you need to specify a polynomial which includes four constants, and that's a cubic, as somebody said. So in the cubic, you have a zero, a one, a two, and a three, four constants. So you have to find this, the values of these four constants such that they satisfy these four conditions. So yes, so it's going to be three. Okay, so let's let's do it. Let's try to, to find the this this constant for the interpolation. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is in the same way as we did in, in the previous chapter is we're going to take this element and we're going to consider, to consider as it were only a single element. So I'm going to set the local x-axis in the horizontal direction. In the same way as we did before, okay, in the next subchapter, we are going to consider the possibility of having elements which are not alignment. And then we can set up again a global reference system and all, on all of that. But so far, right now, let's see if we can solve a problem with alignment being elements, okay? Okay, so we can say that to start, let's consider a single element. Okay, so if we have one single element, of course, we can put it horizontal. 
And this is going to be the local reference system for this element. Okay, this element is going to be defined with two joints, one on the left, one on the right. Okay, now, um, this element will be, or the displacement will be interpolated from this value, this value. So this is phi1z, this is d1y. But on the other side, on the other end, we're going to have to pass through this value. So it's going to be d2y. And also we're going to have, for example, a rotation like this. So we have to have to start here with this slope, and we have to end here and with this slope. Okay, let me put the green. So we have to do something like this, like this. And we have to end here and with this slope. So this is the, oh, forget. So this is the interpolation polynomial that we have to set up. Okay, so the interpolation function that will be employed to approximate people. Final elements is a very good tool, but it's an approximation. So we're gonna use that to approximate. This is approximation in a single element. This is for every element, okay? So we're going to use uh, a polynomial, a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus a3x cubed. Now, our job is to find a0, a1, a2, and a3. So we can say immediately that uh, V at zero here has to be equal to D1Y. So if you roll like this at zero, you obtain A0. So that's A0. And it has to be equal to D1Y. So we know that this constant is equal to this. Next, let's differentiate So this disappears. So we have a1 plus 2x2a and plus 3a3x squared. And again, so this is one value, one constant already. We can say that uh, the derivative at zero here has to be equal to this value. So that's equal to that's zero, that's zero, so A1 has to be equal to phi one z local. So you see that this is the second constant. So we know this one, and we know this one. We need to, to find out these two, okay? Now, in the other end, here, we have the expression, so we can say that V at L, so L is the length of the element. So we have A0, but A0 we know. So we this is D1Y plus A1, but A1 is phi1, so it's going to be phi1z times L plus A2 L squared plus a3, a cubed. And the derivative evaluated at L, here I have it, a1 is equal to phi1z plus 2a2, L, and plus 3a3, three, L squared. And this, I'm sorry, this is equal to d, 
two y, and this has to be equal to phi to z. This is, you, you can see that this is very similar procedure as the one that we had uh, in chapter one. In chapter one was the first chapter of this, of this semester, so it was easier. In this case, I have four constants, okay? Now, I can, know, I can tell you the, 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 the answer for this uh, solution, for the solution for this uh, exercise, and I'm going to write it now. So, we can say that solving For A2 and A3, we have that A2 is equal to <clears throat> um, 3 over L squared multiplied by D2Y minus D1Y minus 2 phi one z plus p two z divided by l. You see that this is length, this is length squared, so result is one over length, this is one over length. So a2 is one over length. And finally, a3, you can find that it is equal to 2 over L cubed D1Y minus D2Y plus phi 1Z plus phi 2Z. We divide this by L squared. I'm going to replace everything. So um, V of X, this is an approximation. See, this is an approximation is equal to A0. A0 is D1Y plus A1. A1 is equal to phi 1Z X plus A2, here I have it. 3 over L squared D2Y minus D1Y minus 2 phi 1Z plus phi 2Z divided by L. And this is multiplied by X squared. And finally, A3, I have it here, so it's going to be equal to 2 over L cubed D1Y minus D2Y plus phi 1Z plus phi 2Z, both divided by L squared. And the whole thing is multiplied by 8X cubed. Okay, so we see that there are some terms which are multiplied by D1. I have a D1, I have a D1 here. Some other tests are multiplied by phi 1z, this one here, 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 and here. Say so one, two, and three. And, and again, there are some terms which are multiplied by phi 2z here, here, these two terms. So what we can do is we can write on this uh, this uh, interpolation in a different way, and that you can recognize. And with this, I, I'll complete the session today. We can say we can we are going to write like this. So we're going to set this row, and we're going to multiply by d one y phi 1z, d2y, and phi 2z. 
So this, this uh, polynomial here will be from this, this very long expression, all terms which are multiplied by D1Y. This one here is going to be all of these terms which are multiplied by phi one z. So here, I'm going to have x. I'm going to have minus two x squared over L. And I'm going to have x cubed over L squared. All of that is going to be here, etc. And from that point, we're going to go something similar procedure as we did in previous chapter. Okay, um, let me save this there. Okay, people, um, remember next week, we're going to have you here. And uh, I let, let me finish and see if uh, any of these have come. Mr. Cano, are you here, Mr. Cano? Mr. Cano, no? Mr. Carrillo? Present, doctor. You are from, are, where are you living right now? In Riobamba? Uh, uh, today in Guayaquil. Okay, so you okay, so you are fine. So I don't have to worry about you. Mr. Cueva, Mr. Cueva is here. No. No, it's not here. Mr. T Leon Tumbaco, Mr. Leon Tumbaco. Neither. Okay. Uh, Mr. Matute. Matute. No. And Mr. Ruiz, Mr. Ruiz, 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 no. Okay. For those of you who come from outside the city and you have to stay here overnight, I'm going to invite you Wednesday and Friday to lunch. Okay. And we can share, the other students can bring your, 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 your lunch and we can share between 12 and 1, and we have a free time, so we can know each other, we can talk. Remember, we have to keep the distances, uh, if possible. Of course, when we're eating, we cannot keep our, our masks, but outside, everything in every other situation, we have to wear our masks, and uh, finally, we can meet each other. I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, I'm really glad to... to to, to, to know who is, is going to be here. Uh, Mr. Galarza, you have a question? No, oh, no, I just say clapping my hands because it's like uh, the dynamic to know each other. To, to yeah, I know. It's some, yeah. I, I'm really excited about it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to know you. Uh, yes, there is somebody has a question? Yeah, or, yeah what, is, what is the hour of the quiz? Oh, shoot. Didn't I tell you? No? I don't know. I have a question in the chat. Okay. Um, uh, let me tut -tut 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 here. We organize this uh, on Wednesday because in that day we know that there is no, no other activity. Okay, so in, on Wednesday uh, you're going to have the quits from 10 to 12. Okay. Don't worry, I'm going to announce this from 10 to 12. And then in the afternoon, from one to five, those who are taking uh, mechanical vibrations, we're going to have a, a, an experiment in the lab. Of course, by groups, because we have to uh, keep track of the maximum number of students who can uh, be in a, in a certain room. So that's what I'm saying, that between 12 and one, we have one hour free and I will offer you. On, on, if you want, on, on Friday, uh, on Friday, the quits in mechanical vibrations will be in the afternoon from one to three. Again, you, you can be here in the morning if you want, uh, and again, I will share a, a, a lunch to those of you who come from outside. And uh, at, from one to three, we will have the quits, and then you will be able to go back to your, your places. Any other question? 
thank you for that. That's that's a good one. Doctor, sorry, I have a question, Carrillo. Uh, uh -huh. How far is the quiz, uh, the chapter two? One, only only one or two? For the quiz, yeah. yeah. Uh, just just to review on bending, that's all. Okay. Only, no more. Only. Today class, no. No, today we review bending. Uh, okay, that's okay. No problem. Thank you. I need you to review that. I need you to review that because with that review, we can go on and we can uh, set up equilibrium for the beam bending and all of that. But I need you to review. That's what I need you to review. And that I'm going to check in the quiz. Okay, any other question, people? Oh, there is, uh, there is some uh, comments on the chat. Uh, Okay, no, that's not related to, okay. So I'll see you uh, Monday.